Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for coming to the Janus talk. My name is Issa. I go by they and she pronouns. I'm curious, um, clearly you read the talk description and didn't hate it if you're here. How many of you checked out the website? Nobody? Okay, so you're probably wondering what on earth Janus is. And also, how many of you um, write front end code as kind of like part of your lives, like you're kind of comfortable with it? Okay, great. Cool. So um, I had a lot of trouble trying to figure out how to summarize Janus for you in like one scientific pithy description. Um, and that meant just I had a lot of trouble like starting this slide deck at all. Um, and so rather than try to give you any kind of like clean description of Janus, why don't we start with three glimpses and an apology. Here's our first glimpse. These are all of the exports um, that are in Janus. This is the top level stuff that comes out if you just require Janus. You can see that there's some nested stuff. Those are still top level requires. They're just, you know, for example, all this stuff under model just helps you deal with models and describe what a model is. Um, so you can see all the way on the left, I'm sorry the font size does seem to be a little small. Um, you uh, have some core data flow components. You have some data structures in the middle here that should look pretty familiar, sets and lists and maps and models. Um, over here, we have a view and a DOM view. So uh, Janus isn't specific to, to a web browser. Um, so the DOM view is our, our web browser viewing. Um, and we have some templating features there. And we have an application uh, sort of glue code stuff that we won't talk about much today. But they just provide context for your entire application. And uh, you can learn more on the, web on the website. So that's kind of like a, a 10,000 foot view. Let's look at some code. So here's everybody's very favorite first front end framework example. It's a task list. Um, and you can see I can come here. I can create new items. Um, I can fill them in with text. I can uh, check these boxes. All this stuff updates. Um, and let's just see how this works, right? So over here, um, we have just our model code. And all we're doing is um, just defining some basic schema information here, right? Done as a Boolean, name as a text. Um, and we also have um, this checklist. And the checklist, we just declare a model. We don't even give any implementation. So apparently, that's all we need to do. Um, so that's the task, and then the checklist is the whole thing, right? And so let's look at the view code. So the view code is what's drawing this stuff along with, of course, some CSS that you're not seeing. Um, the task view, it looks like we have this snippet of HTML. We have the done, and it looks like we render the attribute done into there, which must have something to do with this attribute done up here. Same with the name, this name up here. Um, and then when you click on the button, it looks like we get an instance of the task itself. And all we do with it is we just destroy it. Interesting. Let's look at the checklist view. The checklist view is this whole box together. And it's kind of the same thing in a way. Um, you have this whatever of whatever complete text, which through the magic of CSS ends up on the bottom. Um, you have this list, which is just a list of tasks themselves. So it's going to be the list of these task views. And you have a new button. And so the way you wire that up is pretty similar. We're rendering the, the tasks into the list from tasks. And then let's look at this total count over here. right? Um, we're setting its text from that list of tasks, and we're flat mapping it for some reason. Um, that's kind of strange, but the key part is here. For the tasks, we want to get the task length, which makes sense. However many tasks are in that array, the length of that array is what we want to put here, right? Um, similarly with the uh, done count here, you can see that it's almost the exact same thing. We're just filtering down that task list by whether the task itself is done or not, which we already have a Boolean for. Um, and then we count the length of that. And so that's how this stuff updates. And um, down at the bottom here, we just have this button. And when you click on it, we again get an instance of the checklist this time. And uh, when we get tasks out of it, um, and we have an underscore here for some reason that's very interesting. And when we get the tasks out of it, we just want to add a new task. Finally, we have this glue code over here with the app. Um, the, there's a standard library, um, which we kind of teach the app about. And that just lets the app know how to render things like checkboxes and text boxes, because we didn't do anything with that, right? We also then teach the app views, hey, if you want to draw a task, you want to use a task view. If you want to draw a checklist, you want to use a checklist view. And from there, all we have to do is just create our data. We make a new checklist. We create a new list of tasks. And we ask the app to draw it. And notice what you don't see here. You don't see any handling code. You don't see any reaction code. You kind of just see kind of a seamless blend of timeless binding code and timeful data ma ma manipulation code that really just speaks very simply about what the data task is that you want to do, right? Um, and you might wonder yourself, OK, how does this actually work? And I could show you. I could come here 
and I could delve into here. I could show you how this DOM view is actually composed of these bindings just like we set up. We could look at this two count, and we could see how it's actually doing that filter that we just described on the left. We can look at this filtered list and look, inspect into it and actually see how the original list is actually being mapped by these functions into this current result. I could even go further and show you how this entire slide deck um, is actually uh, being driven by the list of slides agglomerated across all of these sections, um, then just being looked up by this active index, right? And that, that's right here, that's this computation. You can see the history that we've gone through these three slides. Um, but maybe that's a little overwhelming right now, and uh, maybe I should step back, go to the next slide, and turn the console off again. And it looks like it's time for my apology. I am so sorry I'm here presenting a JavaScript frame, front end framework to you in the year 2021. Um, <laughs> I am so sorry. We've all used so many, even if you just look at like the big two, we've all used so many, right? Um, and in my defense, this was started in 2013, which kind of leads to my other apology. I'm kind of out of date. I have code reviewed some React and Vue apps, but I don't really know deeply how they work. And also, I'm really not, um, and have not been for a while, um, a, a full-time coder. I'm really more of a designer. And so I don't have that mathematical brain. So if you, if you come and ask me, like, does this have applicative functors? Is it monadic algebraic? I, I don't know these things. Um, I can tell you I looked at them and tried to incorporate those ideas. Um, but I, I don't have that kind of brain. And again, that's kind of why it was kind of difficult for me to figure out how to describe to you, like, in a sentence, what is Janus? Like, how, how does it feel in a sentence? Um, and eventually I realized that actually I don't want to tell you anything like that at all. I want you to walk away with three ideas about what Janus is, and those are that Janus is ergonomic, thoughtful, and flexible. And so to prove that to you, let's look at some more code. Here we have an example taken almost exactly off the Janus homepage. Um, up top, uh, I'm gonna go through it very quickly. Uh, I just really wanna get you a little more brain practice like looking at Janus code before we move on to bigger examples. Um, here we have um, just some animals, uh, animal species that we're creating. Uh, looks like each one has a name. We're just putting some extra information in there, like whether it's a mammal. We have this pet. Um, it has a name just like our task did, but this kind is now an enum. Um, so you can have an attribute enum. And uh, here is how you provide additional implementation information for like what is that attribute? Describe this attribute. Um, so we can see that the kind can be a dog, a cat, or a parrot, just like we've described up here. So any of these model instances are valid values for this kind. The pet editor down here, um, you can see it just draws each of these lines. It looks very similar to the task list you just saw. The only difference is we have this um, options, uh, which stringifies the name. And of course, you know, these, these select boxes aren't going to be very happy to take animals. They want strings. And so the stringify is kind of just how we make that happy. And then we just make a bunch of our data. Um, and uh, whoops and um, we draw each of these editor lines over here. And down here, what I'm doing is I'm just filtering down by all the dog names. And so you can see, um, we, we start with the pets, we just filter down by pet kind as a dog, and then we grab the name out of it. And that's what's showing up over here. And so once again, what I kind of want to take you away, what, what I want you to take away from this is, um, I can come here and update any of this information on the way, like this dog that I've exposed. And you can see dog becomes pup over here, right? I can update these names, I can update all this stuff. And without really having to set anything up like that, it all just works. Cool. Let's look at um, just a slightly bigger example. Um, this doesn't have very much new stuff in it. I kind of just uh, want to show you what Janus looks like when you're dealing with like bigger, more like real world applications with just like a bunch of croft in them, right? Here's a credit card processing uh, form. And it's not complete, there's no validation. I don't have time to talk about model validation in Janus today. It's also driven by data binding. Uh, but you can see I can you know, fill out this credit card form and it'll tell me what credit card I'm using. Um, and I can tell, tell it I'm at, you know, where, where is this? 12.8 or 18.20, I can't remember. Um, and I can ship my stickers to a different address if I want. So it's pretty standard stuff. Um, and a lot of this is stuff you've seen before. In fact, all of this is just attributes and enums and things. Um, here, we can nest models in models, which makes sense. And the main reason you want to teach Janice about this is so that you can, you can just handle your data when serializing and do serializing and other kinds of tasks. Um, you have the address view down here, which again, verbatim from the task list, right? No reason to change anything about that. On the right is where you have some new things. 
Uh, Janus is a model view, view model framework. We really believe that models are great at handling data and views are really, really great at binding that model data onto the screen and just directly interacting with, you know, telling the model what, it need, uh, what needs to happen. The one case where you kind of run into trouble with this very sort of like tight binding world is sometimes you just have computation or data that isn't model information that your view still needs. And so view models are a very convenient way to do that. Janus allows you to declare a view model class for any view. So every view has a subject, a single subject, as you may have gathered. Um, we can also associate a view model with it. And the, the DOM view will just spin one up and basically bind the subject and the view model against each other with context. And so um, let's take a look at how that actually works. You can see there's um, this different address checkbox here. This is an example of like data that doesn't fit in the model, right? The payment processor doesn't care if the user checked this checkbox or not. They just want to get the payment and the shipping address. Um, and so we put that Boolean in the view model. So it just never shows up in the model at all. It's a view concern. Uh, we also do some computation here. So we're figuring out what credit card they're paying with in the view model, um, just to kind of keep that clear. And maybe if we need to use it in a couple other places, this is a convenient way to, to kind of like store that computation somewhere. And so you can see from, this time we're saying from dot subject. And so that's how from the view model you're saying like, hey, actually I want the context and the subject, get me things from over there. And we want the credit card number. And using that we just do this like truly awful test I wrote just to see whether you're using Visa or MasterCard, right? Um, and where does that get used? That gets used down here in this mu new mutator ha you haven't seen before, which is class group. Um, class group is kind of like you know, just jQuery setting a class. You can, for example, down here, active is just based on that checkbox. And you can see this is from.vm, um, just like from.subject up above uh, reference the, the subject. If you're in the, in the DOM view, you can reference the view model by doing from.vm, right? And that's how uh, this line fades in and out is just that class. Um, but this class group here uh, basically just ensures that no matter what value of this is, there will always be network dash that as a class. So the, the class on, on somewhere in here will always be network dash visa, network dash mastercard, or ma network dash unknown. And I want to just like show you a little bit about how Janice handles that, um, if I can get the console to show up. Um, so I can look at, yes. Um, and here's all that, and here's that class group, right? And so we can look at how that computation happens. And I can just start messing with this. So I can type some stuff in. And you can see right now it's unknown. Um, and as I type in 5, 1, 2, 3, mm, 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 um, you just have uh, all of these changes that didn't actually do anything, but we're still seeing them. And this highlights two things. One, Janus won't update things that it doesn't have to. And two, when you're using these debug tools, even stuff that didn't affect the value, if it could have, you'll know about it. And this is, I, I have found, really crucial for some of these like FRP type things where the data flows sometimes end up like locked away from you or, or the code gets kind of like entered and exited so many times it's just difficult to like debug the thing that you want. This way you get all this history and you can see it. All right, um, the last thing I want to show you on this page, oh, I guess up here, um, Every time you check the box, we're just doing a little bit of work to just duplicate the shipping address, back, uh, the billing address back on the shipping address. And so, so that's how that works. Um, and we are using this shadowing, model shadowing feature to copy the values. Um, again, I don't have time to talk about that. You can check out the website for more. Now, one thing you might be wondering looking at this code is like, Issa, this is like just so repetitive. There's all this boilerplate here. Can't we cut down on that some? And my response is I actually really love repetitive boilerplate. Um, but if you want to do that, Janus is very careful to allow a lot of different styles and flexibility in composition. Um, and so I want to just look at the same sample, but just uh, highlight a couple things, change a couple things and highlight those lines. So you can see over here, instead of finding street and rendering from attribute street and doing the same thing for city, we're just making that data. And we just may have this helper function that then calls find and plugs those things in. Right? And the key information here is that find is perfectly happy not to live inside of template. Um, and in fact, in this right side, we take it even further. We take exactly the same helper function, break it out of everything entirely. Um, and then down here, uh, we use it um, against this array instead. And so that cut down on all of those lines. Um, and so you can, all, all of these primitives in Janus are free. You're free to use them in any way, assemble them in any way. Um, and you'll see over the course of this talk that while you're using Janus, you are actually using the primitives of Janus more or less. You're never very far from the bare metal. Here's another style of composition you can do. You can include templates and other templates. 
Um, and so I can have this as something that exists somewhere else. I can even name templates in situ. Um, if this is really where I want to declare the stuff, but I also want to use it elsewhere, I can name it in situ and reference it back out of the view later. You can find out more about that on the website. So that's sort of like a, a, a sort of bigger, maybe more practical example. Let's change gears a little bit. This is a tabbed text editor. Very simple. You can make some tabs. Um, you can name each document. You can put some text in each document. That's about it. I just want to show you how this works. The document, again, stuff you've seen before. Uh, it's got a title and some content. The editor is the whole thing. Um, it hosts the documents. And so you can see um, we have this initial set of documents, which is just a list of a single document, just so we start with one. Um, and then we have this active document, and is an enum, just like you've seen before. Right? So the, the active document that we are currently looking at that is highlighted on the tab, um, that is uh, an enum here. And the initial values that we wanted to plug in there comes from, well, the first item on the list. And here we see this underscore again, and that's a good time to talk about that. Uh, most things in Janus, if they return values, will give you some sort of a live result. And for most singular values, that's an abstraction we have called varying. They're kind of like mutable properties from Reactive Cocoa, if you ever use that. But really, they're their own thing that, that manage things in their own way and were created just for Janus. I can't really describe to you how they re relate to other kinds of FRP abstractions other than I do think it's monadic. Um, and the way you communicate with Janus that actually I want a point in time result usually is to add an underscore after it. So that's kind of our convention through everything. If you want to do something timelessly, you just call it. If you want to do something timefully, you add an underscore. Um, and so that lets you very seamlessly just express, okay, actually right now I want to get the first document. And that should be initially the, the value whenever you ask for it, right? And the values in the editor are just from documents. I could go through all the work of referencing the model and get the documents out of it, but we have this beautiful from utility that's context-free, and we can just say from documents, right? Um, the document view, very straightforward. The only thing new here is that when we draw this, down, uh, this text editor down here, we're providing this extra information to the app. When the app is trying to draw this view for us, we're telling it, actually, find me something that will draw with like a multi-line layout. And so that's how we get this text editor, or this uh, text area here. Um, and so that's something that we, uh, the app knows about and has been told about. And you'll see a little bit more in that in a second. We have this tab view. So that's each of these tabs up here. We would literally draw a ta tab and just stick the text in it. And below that, we have this editor view. Um, so that's this whole thing here. We'll start from the bottom, actually, because th this stuff you'll, you've seen before, right? Uh, we're just rendering from the active document. And you'll notice it's different between like from and dot attribute and from, right? When you do from active document, that's giving you the actual value. When you do from dot attribute, it's giving you the ins this literal instance um, of attribute dot enum that you've defined here, and that just again like gives you gives the editor the context it needs to like display the right values and do the right behaviors for your attribute, right? Um, and so we're rendering the active document from the active document down here, and that's how you get the main view. When you click on the button, as you've seen before, we get the document list and add a new one. The tabs are the thing I kind of want to show you here. Um, we're rendering from the attribute active document. Right? And so literally, we're asking Janice, I want to pick between documents. That's exactly what I want to do. Um, and how do we want to do that? Well, we give it, again, this criteria. Um, and this time, we're doing a style list. And that's why we're not getting a drop down this time. We're getting this list style, where actually it just draws all the things and can click on one to pick it. Right? And the only thing we're doing is we're saying, actually, instead of drawing them normally, draw them with a context of tab. Where does that come into play? Well, down here, when we're teaching the app what to draw, we're saying that document, if you need to draw a document, you can do it with a tab view if I ask for a tab. And this view registration, I'm not going to get too deep into it, but this indirection is really crucial for some features of Janus that I don't, also don't have time to talk about today, like server client seamless rendering. Janus has the ability to render markup on the server, pick it back up on the client, and make it interactive uh, without any re-rendering and with one set of code. Um, and a big part of letting this happen is to still account for differences that do exist in the environments, right? So for example, on the Janus documentation website, I don't have any interest in creating all these code mirror instances and formulating them down to HTML and sending them to the client um, to, to try to make them work, right? I just put the code on the screen. Um, and so, uh, and then on, on the client version instead, I. Uh, draw the code mirror editor. And so I just register a different view for that exact same model in these different cases, right? And then in that one case, I do have to account for redrawing it. And this applies not just to views, but also remote network resources. You can bind remote network resources directly to model attributes back on the model attributes. And moreover, because we don't have 
promises, we have varyings. You can refulfill a varying as many times as you want. The very first commercial application that ever shipped on Janus actually shipped on WebSockets, um, which is very interesting. And on the server side, it used HTTP to communicate within our stack to get the data it needed, right? So that was kind of um, how we managed that. And the only thing you have to do to account for those environment differences is just register a different set of resources when you spin up your app. You don't have to branch around. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to highlight. The other thing I want to show you has more to do with the sample itself, and that's how we did these tabs. You know, like often if we want to do tabs, we go get like a tab component and we feed into it like, okay, here are the tabs and icons maybe, and here's like an event or handler for when you click on a tab and then I'll update the data um, up here, right? We don't do any of that here. We ask for the thing we want. We want to choose between an enum. The power of like the Janus sort of library and the way it maps data on the screen isn't that we've created like a massive, amazing, beautiful library of components for you. Actually, all the components we have are really primitive. It's in the ability to express your ideas in a way that map on the screen and almost turn problem solving into data modeling. I want to show you an example that goes deeper into that. Here are three boxes. You can drag them around. You can see down below here's just some like working data, debug data that um, we're exposing just so you can a little bit see how it's working. But let's talk through it. Um, we have uh, this workspace. We don't even offer, bother to offer an implementation. It's just the main box. The workspace view, we just draw the workspace and we put the boxes in it. So the box, again, no implementation. But when we draw a box, again, we draw a box. And we set the CSS left to left and top to top. And we just change into percents so that CSS is happy. Um, and then finally, we, on mouse down, it looks like we want to drag within the workspace, so that's within, within this box, the left and top properties as X and Y. So X and Y are kind of configurable property names on the box model itself with this drag utility. And the reason for that is because this is actually copied out of, I think, the Janus documentation website. Uh, this is real working code that I wrote. So let's see how drag works, right? This first set of parameters we take um, are very, uh, are just the ones that we supply here, right? Work, workspace left and top. And the second set of parameters we take relate to the event handler for mouse down. So event is the web browser event. It here is uh, the box model, and view is the box view. And so we just have the, that data to kind of play with and do what we need. I'm not going to go exactly into, depth, uh, into every single line here, but um, in general what we do is we create one of these drag models, which we define up here. All right. And uh, we just kind of feed it some basic information so that it can compute with. So we have this container, and we just want to give it that DOM view, right? And so we have this view navigation stuff, uh, which helps you navigate the view hierarchy and gives you a little more control into like context. Like if you're drawing interface for a list item, sometimes because Janus is so independent um, and, and kind of decentralized, it can be difficult to get sibling context or get the parent list context to do something with it, which sometimes you just have to do in UI. Um, and so view navigation lets you do that. Um, I'm not going to get too into it, but uh, you can see there's an underscore here, which should tell you something about you know, what this feature can do for you if you want it to. Right? So that's how we get this DOM. And then um, the in values are just the current x and y off of the box model itself. Right? So that's how we set up sort of this little model here. Um, we have this at uh, method on the drag model, which um, I'm not going to kind of go into the implementation of. All it does is read a mouse event and store it at like, a, a location on the model. So for example, we have out.x, out.y. Down here, when we call operation at down with the mouse down event, it'll say down.x, down.y is whatever the current event is. right? All right, next, um, anytime you move your mouse in a window, we want to set the now, right? And so now that we've actually set in and down and now events um, or, or data, uh, we actually have everything we need to compute where the box should be now, right? So here's that computation up here. It's pretty straightforward. And we just use it once for x and once for y. Um, and, and by the way, this is how you bind multiple values together in Janus um, in a single statement, right? So you say from in x, from down y, from now, now x, I didn't say that right, uh, you just flat map all of those to the calc. Um, same thing with y. And so based on those out values, now down here, every time they change, we're just setting the new computed value back on the original box model. All right, um, set is curried, so that's why uh, you're only seeing the key here. Um, but, and you might be wondering to yourself, um, what is listen to and what is react to, right? React is how you kind of observe um, a varying over time, and, and you definitely know what listen, to, listen is, but what are these two things? They basically just tie those listens and reactions to the life cycle of that model. So anytime that model gets destroyed or cleaned up, which happens right here when we mouse up on the window, 
um, operation.destroy, all of this stuff goes away, right? And so that's how this all works. And the thing I kind of want to draw your attention to is how models in Janus can almost become problem-solving spaces, almost like even like observable notebooks, right? Um, they're these nonlinear spaces where you can just reason about data values. You don't have to order them. You don't have to tightly bind them. Um, and it's very easy to, to think about and refactor. It's very easy to grow. Um, and, and it just frees you from a lot of the sort of rote maintenance that usually happens in, in building these kind of computations, right? Let's take that just a little bit further. Um, oh, actually, I want to say one more thing. Um, I, I often get the sense in Janus that I'm not really writing objects or code or components anymore. I'm kind of like building these contraptions. I, I don't know how to convey it. Like, I get this feeling like I'm not writing code. I'm building these little like living contraptions that are interbound in these different ways and, and have these different ways that you can poke at them to spring and spring them. And the, the seamless blend between timeful code and timeless code, you know, bound code and imperative code, is I think a big part of why that happens. It, it's very natural to express both kinds of things that you want to do. All right, one very last example. Um, I just want to show you here how easy it is to extend Janus. Almost everything that's built into Janus can be extended however you like. So you can see over here, uh, we have this flyout renderer, right? So you've seen render, which just renders the thing you want in a box. Flyout says, OK, well, when you hover over this thing, I will render the thing you want in a flyout on that thing. And we've implemented that on the left here. And you can see this is find2. This is our own find that we've just created. And it's got this flyout mutator on it that we just created. Right? So let's very quickly take a little bit of a look at how that works. On the left here, we have a, one more of these like, little sort of like model machines. right? Um, usually when you uh, do a flyout, you know, if you hover over the trigger, the flyout should appear. If you hover over the flyout, it should remain. And so we have two things that we kind of have to keep track of, whether you're moused over. And so from those DOM elements, we're just mapping into this is hovered uh, utility, which we've, we're building from um, a Janus lib sort of like bridge utility to events, right? So every time the DOM element is mouse over, uh, the value should be true. Every time the mouse, the mouse leave event fires, change the value to false. We don't even care about what's in the event, just what event happened, right? A very convenient way to track like mouse stuff like this. And down here, you can see we just have a little extra stuff for null checking because flyout won't always be there. Now we want the hovering to, to we want the flyout to stick around whether wh whichever thing you're hovered over, and so we just look at those values and we or them. And finally, one thing is like it, it sucks um, to to have no wiggle room, right? And also you might as well do it in CSS then um, when you mouse out, right? It's nice if the flyout hangs around for a second and, and you don't lose it immediately. So, and, and this kind of thing can be tricky in like a, a really like truth bound, data bound world, right? Where everything is the truth right now. And so Janus also provides some some utilities to lie a little bit, manipulate the truth a little bit. So for example, the sticky utility says that anytime you see the value true come through, hang on to it for an extra 250 milliseconds seconds, right? Notice how we don't have to write freaking like set timeouts and clear timeouts and all this crap, right? We're just talking about the data. All right, the flyout view really just um, positions itself on screen, and when it shows up, it does some calculations so they can position on, itself on screen. And the flyout renderer is down here. We're making one of these uh, models up here. Right here, we're just doing it in a way that makes it resource managed. Um, and I don't have time to talk about the resource management and lifecycle stuff in Janus. It's on the website. You can learn more about it there. Um, but the essence of this is that um, when, we draw, when we draw this app here, and, and often I use the app as like the root view of the entire, of any entire Janus application, right? Um, there's, there's always some root view. And in that root view, I'll just, I'll always just put this flyout list at the bottom and just render all the flyouts. And so anytime someone wants to add a flyout, shove it in apps, and app will go, oh gosh, I got to render a flyout now, and it'll show up, right? Um, and so every time um, we should be active, we add uh, our flyout to the app flyouts list. And anytime we shouldn't, we remove. And that's kind of how this works. Um, but we kind of have like one weird issue here. It's actually not working. So why don't we take a look at that? Um, so I can show you this DOM view here. And you can see this binding here is that text that just uh, binds the text that's in the thing. But here's um, the actual computation for whether the uh, flyout should show up. And here's the flyout model itself. Right? So let's look at the flyout model itself. And you can see that when we hover over this, it turn, the, the hover trigger turns true. And we hover over that, even the hover flyout turns true. Right? And forgive the positioning getting screwed up. The slide scaling screws it up. Right? 
Um, but for some reason, the hovered any, if you look at the hovered any down here, which is ultimately what matters more, it goes from true to null for some reason. What's the deal with that? Well, we can take a look at this, and we can you know, maybe also pin this so we can just have it down here. And this false is um, the, the hover trigger. And you can see this or is the or we're doing to, to or together these two values. And the other value we're getting is always null. And in fact, it's never changing. That's strange because I know from up here that the hover flyout is definitely working, right? And so what I can do is I can say, well, uh, oh, I have a typo here. That says flip out. So if I come back here and change this to fly out, all of that will work. All right, so you're definitely wondering now, how does any of this work? Um, so we'll get into a little bit of it. Uh, the first thing I want you to know is that Janus is pretty small and it's very decentralized. It's about 3,500 lines of CopyScript and it's written in CopyScript because it was starting in 2013, right? There's no reason we shouldn't port it at this point. You can see that there's no sort of like big orchestrator. There's no central manager here. The, the largest file here is varying, and that's just because it has all these different sort of like data combinations and, and um, resource cleanups and things to, to, to handle. All this stuff is really small. You can see I mentioned app provides context for your entire application. It's 43 lines, right? Um, so it's actually not doing work. It's literally just providing context. So how does all this stuff work? Janus is really like a, a build a trillion pipelines through syntax uh, sort of deal. So let's look at one of these from statements that we've been kind of um, throwing around, right? We can assign it into a variable. And if I return this variable, it's, it's totally useless. Janus doesn't even want to draw it. Um, because this is all just inert. There's, there's nothing here. You can't do anything with this, right? You have to give it some data context to work against. And so if I make a data object here like this model, I take that chain, I can then point it at that data context. And you know, models provide a pointer for you, which will point um, any from statement against themselves. Um, and then we just have this inspect.panel down here so that we can see the result. And uh, that maybe helps some, but not much, because what on earth does data pointer do? So let's look into that. Um, so this is up here is exactly the same code. Uh, it's just that we've implemented data pointer specifically for this context ourselves. So we're saying chain dot point, and we're giving our own function. We're using this match thing. Uh, we do have like kind of primitive case classes in Janus, um, kind of stolen from Scala. They're not meant to be anything like pattern matching or anything like that. It's really just varyings can store one value, and if we want to store like success or failure along with that value, it helps to just wrap it in something that looks like a case class. And then it also became a nice way to express extensibility like this. You can you can build extensibility in and use case cast class matching to actually like build all those features, right? Map all those features in when you need to. So here what we're doing is we're matching each of these from statements, right? Each of these from components. And we're saying, well, if I see a dynamic one, and what's dynamic? Well, you remember I can do like from.vm or from.subject, all these things. If I don't provide a, an explicit thing that I'm looking for, it's from.dynamic, right? I don't know what you mean. Um, and so every time I'm handling a dynamic from, whatever key you gave me inside of it, which can be any parameter, it doesn't care, um, I just want to go to this data and get it, which will get us a varying of that value. Right? And that kind of reifies that computation. That gives it the data context it needs to make this a real computation bound against a real data source. And you can see that here, two and three and all that. Down here, I've written all of that again, just kind of broken out um, and not compiled through Janus. Right? So you can do a varying.all, data.getx, data.gety, and then map all of that. Uh, or you could lift it instead if you want to. There's a number of different ways to do this stuff. Um, but what I want you to see is how this kind of maps together. You know, we're doing a dot all, dot all. We're doing a data dot get x, and that, that's, you know, this is fulfilling that, and the x is coming from here, you know. So this is all just kind of getting assembled from this very context-free stuff, and the, the context is being provided um, when we need it. But notice what isn't happening here. Anything. <laughs> it's all pure. There's, there's no side effects here, right? And in fact, Janus is telling us that it's inert. There are no observers. And only when we click on this does, does it finally tell us it is five, right? So Janus does try to be lazy whenever it can. And it won't run any computation. It doesn't have to, um, with an exception. Uh, but let's actually add some side effects to this. And that'll just kind of round out our, our little tour into like Janus internals. This right here is literally a mutator from Janus. It's modeled after the jQuery Atcher. Uh, you know, command. Uh, it takes a prop that you want to set. It takes some um, data, where, of course, in our case, the data can be a value that changes over time. Um, and, and so it does stuff with that. Um, and the second thing it takes is just context, right? Notice the pattern, what you want, and then the context. 
And so here's the DOM node that you want to affect. Here's the data context. And we have this immediate true thing just because, again, remember I mentioned you can pick up code on the client without re-rendering it. So we do need to be able to instantiate all this stuff without doing anything. And so that's what immediate does. Don't worry about too much of that right now. You can learn more on the website. Let's look at the rest of this, though, how it assembles it together. We're taking the data. We're just pointing it. We do all just in case. But we're pointing it with the point that you give us. Then we react on it, right? So here's the side effects. We're reacting on it finally. Um, and uh, you know, we're passing that immediate. But given the value, then we finally are just using jQuery to, prop, uh, to set the prop. And safe just make sure it's a string so everything's happy. Right, so that is literally an entire mutator in Janus. That is like how Atcher DOM mutation works in Janus, period. Um, and most of the mutators are pretty much that simple. You can even use them directly. You can pull this mutator directly out of the Janus package, feed it these first two parameters, and you have this weird machine that, given some sort of DOM node and some sort of pointing target, uh, some sort of contextualization target for this from chain, will set the ID of that DOM node to the ID of whatever context you're giving it, right? Um, and in fact, this sort of weird setup right here is not any different than what DOMView itself does. Right? DOMView does no orchestration, it does no management. All it does is set these things up and make sure they're torn down and cleaned up afterwards. Um, and React, by the way, um, re uh, returns a, a ticket that lets you tear things down. So that's how it does that. And down here, once again, I've just rewritten this uh, just as like, sort of like, I guess, a compiled version. Right? We're just getting the idea, we're reacting on it, we're setting all this stuff. Um, the main thing I want to illustrate uh, with the Janus internal stuff, besides just giving you a little sense of how it does work, um, is how, again, you're really using the primitives of Janus all the time. And that means that if you ever need to do something that Janus doesn't do, it's a much more seamless tail off, right? It's not like some of these other ecosystems where the platform is generic and abstract and, and kind of uh, a, a little impartial, and, and you can build your own little empires inside of it, right? You, in Janus, the, the primitives kind of, you can, you can continue to pull on them and bring them into the rest of your custom, faster lightning code, um, whatever you need to do if you need to break out of the Janus world, right? It, it really eases that transition. But with all this like, sort of like independent pipeline construction, you must be wondering, like, OK, fine. Is, is this fast? Is this fast at all? And the answer is, like, no, it's not as fast. right? Just inherently, as part of the approach, there's a, lot, a little more memory pressure. There's just so much stuff we have to handle. Um, we do take a lot of care to make things fast. right? All those selectors you saw, we actually pre-compute them. So by the time they're actually running against a view, they're just simple tree walks, they're lightning fast, um, different things like that. But, yeah, Janus is a little slower. Part of that is just because I'm me and you know, I don't have a huge team. Um, and part of that is the approach. But also, I wonder if it's the right question. The goal behind Janus isn't to make a beautiful technical achievement. And it's not to build the fastest functional system ever. It's to make ideas easier, safer, and more comfortable to express. It's to take all of these like features in these modern web applications where we have all this interactivity where like especially when you get into like creative applications or, or building these really complicated management things you have these interactions that become like this right and especially like the more the convenience features the more different ways to do the same thing the more like user friendly things human friendly things you want to add it always does this right to front end code and the whole idea behind Janus is to try to pull those things apart a little bit and clarify the data flows and make them so much easier to express that we actually have time. We actually have time to build these more features, to make our software more friendly for our users, um, and, it, and make it more maintainable in the future so we don't dread building all these features. right? And I would argue that in the end of the day, that's faster. It's fine if we render a millisecond or two faster. And sometimes something just has to run x fast. I fully acknowledge that. But for the most part, I think a friendlier interface will always be a faster interface, because the user gets some of their life back. Um, there is one exception I mentioned earlier to this like performance and laziness. Um, the data structure transformation stuff is eager right now. Um, I'm not clever enough to figure out how to make it not. And I would love your help with that. We'll talk about that in a second. And folds especially are a nightmare, because they're very, very easy mathematically to express in this framework but pretty tricky to make performant. And so that's another thing where I could use some help. 
And that actually gets us really nice, nicely into next steps for Janus, right? I've already talked about some moving out of CoffeeScript. Uh, we can get rid of jQuery. You've seen it everywhere. There's no real reason we need it other than it got us off the ground faster, right? We can get rid of it and just manipulate the DOM, and I'm sure Janus will get faster out of that. Um, but also, I, I haven't felt the need to make it faster. That's part of why it is the way it is. Um, I, I've not run into a problem with it so far. Um, and, uh, you know, even in this world, like very decentralized world, there's still data flows that we can kind of analyze and observe and, and optimize, right? And we're not doing any of that today. What else is next for Janus? Well, this debug tool that you've seen. Um, imagine this being part of your development experience. In fact, it has been part of mine building this slide deck. Every time a sample wouldn't show up or was misbehaving, I could just come in here and take a look at it, right? Um, and, and it gives you this much quicker way to delve around and look at what's going on in your application than I've ever had before. Um, and now imagine, but there's still like this problem here, right? Like I, I'm building the code, I have to rebuild it, I have to reload the deck. Um, once I'm in the deck, I have to recreate the state I'm in that, to, that I had the problem. And then I have to go and inspect and actually like delve through everything and find it. What if um, all of that just worked? Um, and so this is a prototype I worked on a while ago. Uh, for a website I made called Apollo 13 Real Time, which um, actually is run on Janus. And this is just to kind of convey that concept to you. Imagine if um, you can have, this is loading up that Apollo 13 code um, off of disk. You don't see any of it here. And it's actually live reloading it as well. That's what this little refresh does here. You can t turn on and off, right, live reload. On the left here, we're setting up some state. We, we, we're loading some fixture information. We're clicking on some things, different stuff like that. And then we just have all this debug information on the right here, right? So if I want to like, uh, you know, delve into this a little bit, get some more information, I can totally do that, right? Oops, come on. There you go. Um, I can totally do that. And this is a view that can be saved. So imagine now you have all these different views for states that your application can be in or problem areas that you're having. And moreover, what if we can take this a step further and say, actually, what if in this application state, I really like this value? And I could just check a box or something and say, make sure that value is that. It's an assertion, right? It's a very simple cheap unit test. Um, and so imagine that being part of your development environment. That's kind of what's next for Janus. I would love your help with it. If you want to do that, of course, um, I'm sure you'd want to check out the website, um, JanusJS.org. Um, it has, among other things, of course, an API reference, but also a practical guide for people who learn better hands-on and building things, and a first principle guide for people who really want to delve into the theory and learn how to use these building blocks. And we also do have like a code of conduct and a Discord, which is just me. Um, this talk is also available on GitHub if you want to check it out. Um, all the source code is there. Uh, you can run it yourself. Um, it is a little sensitive to the screen size, but hey. Uh, I also have one very quick plug for you. Um, I work on a free and open source project called ODK. It is a Android-based mobile data collection system used pretty much every year in every country on Earth. We missed North Korea this year, but whatever. Um, we are used uh, by NGOs around the world for everything from uh, deforestation monitoring, uh, species endangerment, disease tracking, and vaccination efforts, ring vaccination and other things, which, as you might imagine, has made the last couple of years very intense for us. Um, we're almost entirely volunteer run, and one thing I have found in the 10 years working on this project is that open source really only works for developer-focused projects. There are exceptions, but man, we're, I'm so pleased when I get a contributor a year. And so, um, you know, Red Cross, for example, is one of our users. I don't care about the Red Cross. I mean, I do, but if the Red Cross wants a problem solved, they can hire someone to do it. What I care about is the, the countless tiny shops around the world using this stuff to solve problems in their communities, because that is happening every day. And those people depend on your help. So if you could, please check it out and consider lending some of your hours. I'd like to close out just by asking one more time, what is Janus? Is Janus a framework about FRP, kind of? Is Janus a framework about timefulness and timelessness, kind of? Is Janus a framework about um, you know, all these different things, kind of. But that's not why it is the way it is. In fact, if you go back to 2013 when I first talk about this and you go back to, you know, the, all, the entire history of the source code is online, you can see that a lot of these interface ideas, a lot of these expression ideas were there. They were just, they were way more OOP and there were way more other things just to, you know, Janus has always been a framework that's tried to cater to familiarity, right? Try to cater to the familiarity of um, people who are writing code today already. Um, and, and so it's not any of those things. Janus is the way it is because the goal was to make it ergonomic, thoughtful, and flexible. 
right? We arrived at this huge constellation of primitives because we wanted to be flexible. We arrived at this binding syntax because we wanted to be ergonomic. We solve a lot of problems that I didn't manage to talk about today, um, and that's kind of the thoughtfulness. And that's what I really hope you take away from this talk. Thank you so much, and thank you for Strange for having me.